JD here. Welcome to the Mead House. You know, over the past several years, we've watched over 125 episodes of mead making, education, information, and entertainment. More than 80 guests have stopped by the Mead House. Professional mead makers, medal winning home mead makers, competition organizers, experts on yeast, and honey specialists have all visited to share their knowledge. The Mead House has produced the home mead makers and brewers looking for a bit of inspiration and information from the many guests and discussions we have here at the house. You can help support the Mead House by joining the Mead House Keyholder Club on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and search for the Mead House. There's also a link in the show notes. For as little as two bucks a month, you can become a keyholder. We've teamed up with some great companies to provide thank you gifts for your support. So get on over to Patreon, join the Mead House Keyholder Club, and get your own set of keys to the Mead House. Hey, you can listen to the Mead House podcast with your favorite player and be sure to rate us five stars on iTunes or your favorite listening venue. And when you get some time, please take the survey located on the website, themeadhouse.com slash survey. We'd like to hear from you. The Mead House. Mead making entertainment you just don't want to miss. Hey, they're a family of farmers. They tend the land together. Then they run their businesses with the support of each other. They love sharing the abundance of their harvest, and they take pride in getting their hands dirty. I'm talking about tart cherries, apricots, apples, peaches, plums, and a whole lot more. Tree-ripened fruit for your brewing. I'm talking about King Orchards in northern Michigan. Stop by their online store at kingorchards.com. And if you're in North uh, Northern Michigan, you can visit them at two locations. That's kingorchards.com. And thanks, King Orchards, for your support of the 2019 Iron Bee. Hey, welcome to the Mead House, and thanks for stopping in. This is episode number 128. You can catch the podcast on all the usual suspects. I keep saying that every week, too. iTunes, Stitcher, you know the ropes. It's all listed on the website, themeadhouse.com. Hey, The Mead House is produced for home mead makers and brewers looking for a bit of inspiration and information from the many guests and discussions that we have here at the house. Talk to us. We're on Facebook and Twitter, both at The Mead House. Hey, you can email us, too, at info at themeadhouse.com as well. Hey, Jeff and Ryan are both seated at the bar. My name is J.D. Webb. In this episode, he's the medal-winning mead maker. He won the Iron B MVP Challenge. Nathan Stigman stopped by the house in this episode. We'll get his thoughts and perspective on putting award-winning meads together. And he's also medaled in various other competitions as well. And in segment two, uh, from the surveys uh, at the uh, meadhouse.com, we're going to talk about a couple of things. Uh, some recipe development, ingredient characteristics, and maybe a few different techniques for mead making. Also, Jeff uh, wants to lead a discussion on cooking with meads as well. In segment three, as always, Facebook friends, this is where we make the attempt to answer a few questions with no formal expertise other than what the three of us have experienced in our own brew house. All that and more here at the house, but hey, thanks to all of those who signed up for the Mead House Keyholder Club. That helps keep the Mead House podcast free. You too can become a Mead House key holder uh, for as little as two bucks a month. We've got some great thank you gifts to send you. Get on over to patreon.com, search for the Mead House, or you can just simply click the link in the show notes on each episode. Hey, what are we drinking tonight, Jeff? Uh, I believe this one belongs to you, my friend. Uh, it was a brown bottle with an orange top. I think it was an orange top. Uh, yeah, orange top. Uh, it's got a, a label on it, uh, handwritten. It says bourbon barrel aged size or not. Cheated and took a couple of six sips before uh, we got rolling here. <laughs> Dude, you got this. You, you got you got the number on this one. This is really good. Yeah, this is mm. seriously one of the best things I've made in the last year or so. I mean, uh, I could not be more pleased with that one. <laughs> oh my god, it's got. That that bourbon barrel characteristics coming through, ever so slight. I love the flavor of that, uh, and then it's um, met with the apple, uh, uh, the apple flavor uh, from the apple juice that you use, and it finally finishes. I get this whiff of honey uh, at the back end too. It, this stuff is really good. Um, 
Now it's still, uh, and I'm curious, did you, was it a conscious decision you made not to carb it or is this something right out of the barrel? You thought this is a winner, leave it alone. Don't touch it. You know, it, it, to an extent, it was just a, this is awesome. I'm not going to fuck with it. Pardon my language. Um, I, uh, that's how, that's how we edit the show. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, no, I uh, I had this sitting in the the, uh, the first use bourbon barrel for I want to say nearly two months. Um, it, it sat in there for quite a while, and you know, as I think I'd mentioned before, I withheld an extra gallon from the cider the cider mix that I'd made uh, just to make up for that angel share. I it was anticipating you know missing some uh, by the end of it, and I did lose about three quarters of a gallon actually. Mm-hmm. Um, the end of the day, though, I uh, I finally got a taste of this after kind of forgetting about it for a couple of weeks. I, I went, oh my god, this is this is excellent, I, you know, outstanding. It, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not going to water this down. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, this this is outstanding. Uh, I'm digging this. I mean, it just it's got everything. I, I think it has everything in a bourbon barrel aged sizer that you that you're looking for. Uh, that first initial sip I get is is everything that barrel gives it uh, right off the top, oh, yeah. uh, and, and I love that. It's got so much of that vanilla character that just really plays through nicely. Yes, um, I couldn't be more pleased with it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I thought about I thought about carbonating it, but I thought you know that's just going to throw off the the balance a little bit enough that I'm, I'm I was leery about doing it. So I figured, yeah, I'll leave it still. Yeah, it's plenty good just how it is. I, you know, I think that's a good choice. Uh, I think carving it would have taken it to another level, and uh, I, I'm not so sure that you would have picked up on all of the little intricacies and components and everything that 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 I'm getting out of it now. So, a good choice. I'm I'm glad you left it alone. Uh, double fisting it in uh, Mead House tradition tonight uh, in my other glass. Uh, I'm doing a Basil Hayden dark rye. Uh, this is. Um, Something that I am contemplating on doing another braggot with uh, and maybe incorporating some rye, uh, steeped grains in the rye, or, you know, some rye uh, in the steeped grains, uh, and then uh, maybe mixing in uh, some of this Basil Hayden uh, dark rye. But it's got a sweet, caramely flavor. It's got the characteristics of rye. If you've ever chewed on a piece of rye bread, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I love this stuff. And uh, this is another one thanks to Ryan Richardson. Uh, he turned me on to the whole Basil Hayden line. Uh, so good choice, Ryan. Uh, Jeff, what's in your cup tonight? Well, you know, I'm I'm breaking with Meat House tradition and not double fisting it tonight. I've been a little under the weather the last few days and uh, just, you know, kind of needing to take it easy. So tonight I poured myself a glass of uh, some uh, Sap House Meadery's Jam Sesh Honey Cider. Mm. Um, real light, just nice uh, sizer from, from our friends over at Sap House. Uh, has a great tart apple uh, along the midside. And then, um, you know, you, you take that uh, sip, and you take a breath in, and you just get this huge, like, mouth and uh, nose full of the, the honey and the apple aroma. It's really fantastic for such a light beverage. Good stuff. And uh, I've had that uh, from Sap House. Uh, a couple of cans snuck into my box on the way home from the uh, Iron Bee <laughs> up there somehow. And uh, I even got a hold of Ash and I told him, dude, this stuff rocks. <laughs> I mean, uh, and he was pleased to hear that. And uh, I've got a message for a young man over there at Sap House, Evan Henderson. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later on in the show. Uh, Ryan, uh, you've always got something interesting in your glass. What is it tonight? Well, a couple episodes ago, I was talking about rosé meads. Yeah. And now that I can find the, now that I can see the wild, uh, the, the wine rack, I started digging around in there and I found, um, a little cachet of bottles, a little cachet of bottles that um, were rosé in color. And these are a light fruit um, freezer clean-out mel from about two years ago. Oh, wow. And, and it's delicious. It, it's 
Yeah, I don't mean it's in a negative way, but a lot of the, the a lot of the individual fruits have blended together their flavors. So it's not like you're gonna say, Hey, I get apricot or hey, I get raspberry or hey, I'm getting a lot of uh blueberry or something. You know, it's it's just kind of it's melded into this um really nice uh rose colored uh, mead and it's kind of it kind of drinks in that way like like a wine in that you know you might drink a nice wine and try to pick out something and say oh I, I get uh, cherries in this or I get black pepper in this or I get yeah. lemon in this uh, in that way where it's not jumping out at you and, and you know biting you on the nose but that the flavors are still there they've just kind of blended together a little bit and and it's it's excellent. It's it's drinking very well. I've got a, a few more bottles of this, and and I don't think I'm going to have any left uh, through the next heat wave. <laughs> it's kind of fun when you find stuff hidden in the back of the uh, in the back of the shelf, isn't it? Once in a while. Yeah, I mean, depending on the shape of the bottle and the size of the bottle, I think I can get. Um, 160, 175, 80 bottles of wine on the wine rack. And it's not full. It's maybe, you know, half full. But, yeah, there's – I mean, I, I I do that so that I can drink stuff that's been there. They, the oldest stuff that's currently on the wine rack were some meads that I made back in 2015. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it's it's nice to have enough that you can you can leave a couple of bottles uh, age and see how, they, see how they come out for you. Well, you know, I've, I've heard stories of people finding barrels of mead that they made in the past and, and put away in, in the garage. And, you know, they get covered up by years of accumulating stuff. And then, you know, they sell the house, time to move. And, oh, here's that barrel of mead I made 12 years ago uh, with some surprising results. So, uh, hey, welcome to the club, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I've always wondered. People say they forget about carboys. And they must not have airlocks on them. <laughs> Get out the carboy, you know. You, you're going to come back. You know, the airlock's been dry for six years. You know, yeah. I wonder what that's going like. Yeah. Um, must have you know stoppers on them. Uh, anyway, uh, back in uh, right before the 1990 NFL season, the new uh, sorry. Right before the 1990 NFL season, the Philadelphia Eagles cut uh, Chris Carter, who is now a Hall of Famer, uh, at the press conference being asked why he cut him. Buddy Ryan responded with the infamous line, all he does is catch touchdowns. (laughs) Well, Nathan Stegman, best of shows five. First place ribbons or medals, nine. Silvers, two. Bronzes, two. Some people call that a career. He calls it the first half of 2019. <laughs> Busting onto the scene is uh, like a wrecking ball. This guy started brewing back in college. He didn't get into mead until less than two years ago. It was uh, September 2017. Uh, one of our friends of the show matt whitey was doing a presentation and got nathan interested the next summer so we're talking a handful of months later he went on to win a third place medal at the national homebrew competition and now in 2019 is uh taking the competition scene by storm uh welcome to the show nathan and what's in your cup tonight oh Hey guys, thanks for inviting me. A long time listener, first time guest, I guess. Uh, it's uh, stone fruit and pine at night at the Stegman House tonight. So I am uh, two fisting, uh, not to break with the established meat house tradition and protocol there. Um, I got a nice pine, uh, an orange blossom St. Giovese from one of your friends there, ours uh, truly, Al Boyce, uh, obtained from the Brew for Good event last weekend. It's uh, quite bright and flavorful. It's a citrus take on but it may normally be a more cherry, leathery, and roasty, peppery flavor, and a little more savory. It has some tannins to it, liking that. Um, then I got a uh, 2011 Reserve Peach from Redstone Meadery out of Boulder, mm-hmm. Colorado, and I won that as a nice parting gift from the Don Ross Cup this year. So I'm enjoying that 
quite tremendously. So thank you. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, let's start out. Uh, you were the gold medal winner of the Mead House Iron Bee MVP Challenge, the Mint Vanilla Pine Challenge. Uh, tell us, how, uh, what did you think of that, that competition, and how did you put uh, your entry together? Uh, it's a quite, quite phenomenal challenge. Uh, challenge is the, the inherent word in all of this, I think. Uh, First off, I, I want to say that why Ryan Y was was already taken his name. <laughs> I, I, I seriously didn't want to make uh, you know overall. You, I, I took it quite literally. I made this back in uh, in the middle to end portion of December, actually, when I started. So um, I took it quite literally: uh, mint, vanilla, and pine. And I uh, didn't really want to make mouthwash. Um, positively frightened of ruining this mead. Uh, thinking that, you know, hey, bees have been giving their lives for this honey, right? So I don't want to mess it up. So um, I thought, okay, well, I'll give it a shot. Uh, made a, a smaller batch, maybe a three-gallon batch overall. Um, decided to take out, uh, you know, clover honey, a little bit of dried mint, because they didn't really want to go with all the... Uh, extract the mint uh, horror stories that I was hearing out there. Um, and then, you know, I did uh, go forward with the vanilla beans. I did a, a pound of powdered vanilla beans and then mm -hmm. uh, did uh, add a little bit uh, to hedge of my bats a bit, uh, a couple tablespoons of pure vanilla extract there. Um, and then reading up a little bit about the whole pine aspect um, <laughs> and kind of knowing that people have, you know, boiled needles of white, white pine needles for, for a great tea for, I don't know, vitamin A and C and whatnot. I haven't personally, but uh, found some pine needles, uh, decided to boil that up a little bit and uh, uh, put it through into the secondary. And um, again, after I tasted it, um, wasn't really quite sure and uh, decided to, to go a little bit more with uh, refined pure uh, a uh, pine extract that was actually uh, made from a natural natural ingredient. So um, I, it was a challenge, and, and actually, I, I almost nearly screwed it up because I uh, got a little bit more of that uh, strong uh, old rotten egg smell about the first week or so into it. And I uh, I freaked out, uh, degassed, aerated uh, with the wine for a long time, and then uh, saved it. I guess so. Uh, the result is. Uh, I guess a winner. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of I think a lot of people shed a lot of tears when they heard Ryan describing this challenge <laughs> for the first time. You know, people who compete uh, on a regular basis and they're thinking, "Oh my God, Ryan has just absolutely lost it." I had visions of people going out in the garage and firing up the table saw, trying to come up with some rendition of pine shavings or some damn thing. Uh -oh. You know. <laughs> So. Absolutely, it was uh, just quite a bit, quite a bit of a, uh, quite a bit of gasping around the uh, the audience there as you were. Uh, <laughs> <seeing>. <laughs> you got to spin that spin that flavor wheel a little bit more. I I, I decided to to go forward with it and then persevere nonetheless. So <laughs> thank you for that. How, how, how did well, you? We're glad you did. How, how did you find that challenge initially? Um, I, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out where people's heads were at when, you know, they heard this challenge, and you know whether you initially thought, you know, this this is not a doable thing, uh, or did you just uh, you know put your head to the grindstone and knuckle down and and do this thing? I I, I did the latter. Yeah, I uh, I just basically said, well, I guess. That's what they want. This is the this is the uh, the focus. Um, head on out and do it. Uh, find the the how the ingredients come together and how you're gonna gonna pull it off. I guess that was my yeah. kind of my my focus. You know, and there's obviously a lot of different uh, honeys out there. A lot of different uh, pine interpretations. I don't I don't know that we got so many vanilla interpretations per se, but there was a bit of uh, uh, I don't want to say fighting back and forth about how. Uh, how the uh, the either the culinary interpretation of pine was going or, or otherwise. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was it was pretty amazing. Good. <laughs> Go ahead, Ryan. Well, yeah, Nathan. So you have, I mean, you've just bust onto the scene here. Um, 
one for the the uh, record books, possibly. What is your approach when you are, you know, you put your first meet together in, you know, late 2017, and uh, and all of the the successes um, that you've had. I'd love to love to just hear how how you uh, go through your process of of putting. Um, your meat concepts together and, and, uh, going from there. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, um, I'm, I am happy to be joining the, uh, <laughs> the ranks as a foot soldier in the group of the, uh, longstanding great mazers out there. I, I call a group up here. I, I actually, I call them the Minnesota meat mafia, uh, <laughs> which is some, <laughs> this kind of, it's not a Costa Nostra thing. It's not our thing. It's more, maybe it's uh it's Sora Nostra. Maybe it's our honey. We, I uh, have a lot of great folks here that um, certainly a lot of the groundwork has already been done for me because, you know, we've got we've got people that uh, you've had on the show, Josh Mahoney, Matt Whitey, uh, Kevin, Paul Johnson, Josh Halbrook, a lot of these folks here that, um, you know, the list goes on and on. They've they've done a lot of the groundwork. And then uh, I guess, you know, knowing that that's uh, – it's whether I think I tr- choose to really internalize every detail or, or chart my own course of uh, – I read up on a lot of different things. I believe it's a bit of both. I'm sure I'm not the only one out there, but you know, starting this hobby could have been a little more cryptic uh, had it not been for some basic basic advice, you know, and guidance. I uh, uh, have to thank Matt Whitey for that in particular. Um, but you know, looking and seeing what what it is, what what are the basics, um, you know, how how we add things together, and maybe just taking that back a little further. It's just it's just centering itself on on trying to do the right things by the yeast, the fermentables, um, tasting and reviewing. I always keep hearing that, um, hoping not to mess it up, hearing that from others, and, you know, really refining the batches of mead that we like to drink by repetition. So you're trying out all these other styles and having a lot of great exploration. Um, I just like to think, well, what, what would I like to drink? Um, how can I put these these flavors together? Um, even even in the sense of just, you know, trying to do a traditional really well, starting from there and then adding on uh, the, the fruits and uh, and whatnot. So I'll, I'll pick out different things. Um, you know, in, in particular, it's uh, it's just that, you know, I might do something a little differently. Um, I kind of still operate off of Tazma, and, and then I, you know, people say, well, you could do something a little differently. Will we, you know, ironically, I, I use my own methods based on those step additions and um, not unlike Tasna. And, um, but I also sort of do the less regimented behaviors and experiments and uh, the timing of when I add the nutrients, maybe a bit more on the front end, loading more, the, the time of fruits, the amounts I use, the yeast I use. It's, it's not uncommon for me to just simply try out different yeast together in a combination of yeast to see what happens. Mm. So that's uh, kind of your, there's my paradox, if you will. I, <laughs> I may well prove the workout. Uh, only time will tell. Um, you know, I, I like to like to put things together and just kind of see how they go and go to a potluck, see, uh, to see what others think. Um, it's best when it's shared with friends and relatives and, uh, you know, you take the feedback and then you go back to back to work. Kind of like having your own chemistry set without poisoning the rest of the family, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Poisoning is, is not, not part of the job detail, yes. <laughs> cleaning, cleaning job number one, uh, for sure. Yeah, but, uh, You know, it's, it's funny. I think the thing is that the thing I'd like to say is, that, you know, it's hard when, you, when you're living in Minnesota here and uh, there's not as many uh, commercial meteries and Meads is accessible to me as I think I drank more uh, homebrewed meads um, than than anything hands down with commercial, and I, I'm just amazed at the level of talent we have here. And um, it's sort of like, wow, you know, I'm inspired by that. We inspire each other. You know? Yeah, I think, uh, that's really what it comes down to: sharing and uh, saying, well, you know, maybe maybe I'll try that, or maybe I'll try that special spice ingredient. Or uh, um, I know I know we have the Iron Bee and uh, I got some interesting takeaway prizes there, some nice clover honey. And um, actually, even my wife and kids for Father's Day brought me some nice orange blossom honey, which my daughter loved that little bear from the samples at the <laughs> Iron Bee, the Buzz and Bee Company. So yeah. um, we, uh, I guess I got a whole class of egg meads that I haven't come up with yet. Maybe just need to spin that wheel again, Ryan, and see what we, what we can come up with. <laughs> no, keep Ryan away from that <laughs> wheel. <laughs> No, no garlic and watermelon right now. <laughs> <laughs> but did I, I did yeah. get some, uh, 
some of those uh, those those nibs, uh, the uh, Meridian, uh, the nibs, and <laughs> yeah. uh, interested to try something out with that in the clover honey, maybe some coconut, maybe if uh, you know, add some blueberry to it, see what happens. Something unique. I love it. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> that could be good. That you, yeah. there you go. You might have just made next year's challenge. Uh, coconut. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh, here we go. I don't don't put me on the spin just yet. <laughs> Cats out of the bag on episode one twenty eight, guys. Here we go. Uh, so, so Nathan, you you talked about using different yeasts and blending some yeast and trying some yeast out. Do you have a go-to yeast that, that you use for most of your stuff or um, are you really all over the board, uh, you know, with, uh, with what you're trying and, and have you found um, some yeast combinations that you like? Yeah. You know, I actually am all, all across the board. I, I have read up on just sort of, in general, when you're first first engaging in this, on uh, kind of the use of descriptions that are out there from a lot of these these postings online and, and Facebook groups, et cetera. So, um, just really uh, looking across the board at some yeast that that actively uh, um, you know put off some phenols at higher temperatures and whatnot. I'm I'm generally speaking at a cool, comfortable uh, uh, 60 65 area in my basement for for quick bulbs. I've been uh, I've been using things across the board with the uh, some drier yeast to try to figure out traditional drier uh, meads. I know that uh, you know it's it's either a DB10 or otherwise. 71 B has always been around roundabout, but I looked at the 47. Some of the sweet mead yeast, um, kind of doing some combinations. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, adventures in mead making with, uh, you know, taking one particular uh, kind of honey and then maybe saying, well, what, is it, what does this work with, uh, with when I do a combination of yeast and see what happens? Um, I'm all about that for sure. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely something I'm, I'm trying and uh, uh, experimenting with all the while. <laughs> Interesting. So are you using a lot of wine yeast or are you also going into some of the beer yeast? Um, yeah, actually, I mean, I've, I've used a lot of wine yeast. Um, I did pick up, uh, at certain points of time here to say, um, like the uh, Kvyek yeast, uh, the Fram Garden, um, some other ones to, to test out. Um, so it's, it's not strictly, strictly on that end. I mean, I guess, uh, you know, I have used some more dry yeast, the USO5 or, or whatnot, just to, some things along those those lines. I did try more of a uh, a Belgian uh, yeast, just you know, in general, see what kind of phenols I'll, I'll get from that, um, see what happens. Um, but yeah, it's it's amazing kind of how um, how that all works with respect to the, the honeys you're using and um, yeah, what the outcomes are. Excellent, excellent. Um, I'll let uh, first of all, guys. Feel free to jump in here, uh, anybody. Um, I don't need, don't mean to take over the the conversation. Um, I'll give you a couple ones. You, you've also made some fruit beers um, that have been highly acclaimed throughout the years. Uh, tell us what what's it been like transitioning, or you know, making your fruit beers uh, versus making your melomels. Oh well, yeah, I guess maybe just you know in general, um, if I'm if I'm making the mead, I'll, I'll often wait at least a week or two before adding any of the fruit component to a melomel. That's just my take. I just kind of feel like we got to get a healthy start and uh, and not trying to eat up all of the flavor, depending on what kind of fruit I'm using, how dry you want to allow that mead to go, or the even yet yeah, the uh, the stopping period or trying to halt the yeast, you know, sorbating that. Um, and letting that, that finish, if you're depending on what's, you know, if you're making a, a hydromel or you're going further out in the standard mill. Um, but you know, looking at what what I, I've done with uh, with beer, it's usually been upfront um, uh, some levels of step additions. I did uh, uh, this past week. I made a um, uh, this past weekend. We had a, a beer that was that was being served up that was. Uh, using a, a, a caramelized pineapple 
that was done mm-hmm. in step editions. Um, I, I uh, had a pineapple upside down blonde ale that I uh, I put uh, step oh, yeah. editions of of uh, caramelized pineapple into uh, secondary fermentation, and then um, brought back mm-hmm. some natural pineapple flavor to that. Um, I've used um, uh, Meyer lemons and uh, Eureka lemons to make a lemon shandy. Um, and then mainly uh, used uh, Meyer lemons in a secondary vessel, minus the uh, minus the, uh, the 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 external uh, peels and everything, just to try to make sure that it was giving more of that citrus flair. Um, but with meads, you know, it's it's one of those things where um, I, I think truly for me, it's in the middle uh, middle of things. Um, I've tried uh, a number of different experiments and. Uh, Plummeting as much fruit as possible, and in, in in front, I I know I never make a, a Kirk stock mead because if I, I I don't know if it's done if I chew it, you know. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so it's I think that's the that's the epitome of something that I could aspire to. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's all across the board, really. Um, but I definitely think you know there is a there is a definite difference between what I do for for a beer with fruit than than what I would do for a meat beer. You know, we've uh, our our show, Nathan. Have you, have, you know, you've probably heard us say before on on different episodes. Uh, and of course, we always mention at the top of the at the top of the show. The show is all about inspiring. This is not a recipe show. We're not here to you know help. You know, I mean, we'll talk about sure. different recipes and ideas for recipes, but we're mm-hmm. not going to sit here and and teach you how to do a recipe. That's just just not our thing. Sure. Uh, what we try to do is inspire people to one think outside the box. I know that's kind of an old cliche too, but uh, mm-hmm. but to develop some kind of inspiration based off of what they might have heard someone else say, whether it's me or Jeff or one of our guests, Ryan, uh, here on the show. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, w- since you started mm-hmm. making mead. What what has been your biggest inspiration? Uh, what has given you your inspiration along the way? Well, I mean, I guess in in the in the true wonder of things, you know, when you trying different honeys, there's there's just so many honeys out there, and I'm not as much of a world traveler as I, I'd like to be. I've been to Greece, I've been to Paris. You know, but I haven't really been to a lot of countries. I'm not a world traveler. A lot of these uh, honeys are from countries I know I may never visit in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. And so much of a great introduction into a way of life and understanding about how these honeys came to be accessible to me, it's uh, it's phenomenal. Um, when you find something that you like, um, that honey speaks to you. And, and I can't really put it into any other words than that. Um and really, from that end, uh, it's transformative. What you want to do with it, how you want to uh, saturate that, and come up with something uh, hopefully phenomenal if you can, and hopefully something you'll enjoy at the end of the day. No matter what, if you're you know competitions aside, everything else, um, something you're going to enjoy and come back to it. Maybe you're going to repeat it. I think that's just what it what it is. There's just so much out there, and uh, just really got to give it up to the bees, you know. Um, that's that's yeah. what I'm about. So, and my my last question, Nathan, goes back to what you said here just a few minutes ago. Uh, kind, kind of kind of a philosophical. Uh, in fact, I wrote it down as Nathan's philosophy. What would I like <laughs> to drink? Uh, hmm. You know, we we've mentioned that on the show too. We we you know. I, I've made different kinds of meads, didn't like them, wasn't happy with them. A lot of them went down the drain to feed the bugs through the L.A. sewer system. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I just, you know, it just, in fact, I almost got to a point where I was getting disenchanted uh, with mm-hmm. the whole thing mm-hmm. until one of our former co-hosts sent me a braggot. And I thought, holy cow, this is this is really good. I like this. And then Ryan, of course, jumps on the bandwagon, uh, got a couple of braggots from him, uh, and he uh, nailed down uh, a pretty solid method uh, for building a braggot. And that's my, that's my thing. Uh, that's what I like to do. And um, 
uh, does has that helped that philosophy? What would I like to drink? Has that helped you uh, uh, along the way uh, develop these award winning meads that you've uh, uh, put together? Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, really, it comes down to defining and and continually to define your own palate. Um, I know Ryan. Uh, I guess said a while back, uh, he, as far as even things like, you know, you really like, if you really like dry meads, you're, you're a dry mead guy or whatnot. If you, you know, if you, you know, you know, the martini's good when it tastes like sand. Um, yeah. <laughs> with, with us, it's, uh, <laughs> it's dry as sand. Uh, but you know, with me, I'm, I'm across the board with, with sweet, um, medium sweet and dry and whatnot. But I think it's, yeah, mm -hmm. it's finding what would you like to drink? Um, that's the exploration of this. And maybe, maybe there's some meads I might not repeat, but there's probably going to be a lot of them that I will. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, before we cut you loose, Jeff, uh, have you got anything for, uh, Nathan? Um, yeah. So, you know, kind of circling back to all of the various, uh, the medals and the, the accolades you've won here, you know, we, we do typically ask for, you know, if, if you had one tip for a beginning meat maker, um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think is a, a a good thing for a beginning meat maker to uh, to focus on if they're interested in taking home some uh, some medals? I um, I think just try to do something um, as simple as possibly possibly <laughs> as simple as possible. <laughs> um, you know, uh, taking heart to finding something you like, um, experimenting on a small level at least making sure you've got everything in your, in your toolkit clean uh, before you start. And then, you know, uh, sharing it. And certainly uh, the, the way to get good feedback, even if you're not competing in a contest is to share your mead with other folks. Um, and uh, don't, don't be uh, discouraged. If not, everybody is into this thing called mead. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of folks that I've come across that, don't don't really understand it don't know what it is um and are quite surprised when they're turned on to it so um really just uh uh embrace the gift that that mead making gives to you right on that's great advice you know one of the things that i came away from the iron b uh my god that that saturday night was just one of the most incredible nights of my life uh mm -hmm. i tasted so many different kinds of meads uh, far more than what you, well, I should say far more than what I would typically find on the shelf in my, uh, the two liquor stores that carry meads. Um, so much more diversity. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I mean, I mean, and this is not a dig on, on professional meaderies, but I mean, at some point, sometimes one melomel tastes like another melomel. Uh, the stuff I had Saturday night was just incredible. Uh, and these are guys that were thinking completely outside the box. And, uh, mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate the effort and hard work and, and, and their thought and their philosophy and everything, uh, you know, like you, that you put into your, into, into your mead making, um, oh, you. yeah. good stuff. Yeah, I know. That. Yeah, maybe, uh, <laughs> so go ahead. Oh, no, I just, I mean, I, I, I definitely, uh, feel rather lucky just to say the least, uh, being around folks that, that have been engaged in this in Minnesota and, uh, you know, starting up their own uh, Valkyrie's Horn at the end of September and trying to trying to come up with a competition that's uh, kind of taking things to the next level, this this big group. But it's, uh, it's, uh, we're all about challenging each other, definitely. Uh, dude, I wish you could have seen the – I wish you could have been there when I took a sip of your MVP – Oh really? <laughs> me too. Yeah, it was me and yeah, it was me and Jeff and Ryan uh, that that judged the MVP. And oh my God, you should have seen the expression on my face. I could not believe what I was drinking. Wow. I could not believe. I, I appreciate that. Oh my God! I mean, <laughs> the, the mint vanilla. I mean, every component. I mean, came together just masterfully. I mean, it was just it was unbelievable. Uh, Thank and, you so uh, much. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so I, much. <laughs> I named it the uh, the Altitudine uh, Montes. That was my mountain climber <laughs> mead because it was definitely a challenge and a half. 
<laughs> to say the least. <laughs> wow. Uh, maybe two quick questions here before we let you go. Um, mm-hmm. You know, on the beer side, I know guys that have their own tricks to winning medals in competitions. So they say things like, oh, you know, um, make your your barley wine, uh, you know, less alcoholic than style, you know, slightly, slightly less, uh, you know, less ABV than style, you know, it'll go better in the flight or maybe over hop your, your pale ale. So it's just, just a little hoppier than style just so it stands out a little bit. Um, and they got these little, I guess, hacks, you'd call them, that kind of a thing. Um, when you are sitting down and you're making competition meads or meads that you're going to send to competitions, do you have any kind of uh, little tricks or hacks or philosophy like that of saying, I'm going to make this one stand out uh, in that flight? Oh, wow. Um you know, I, I hope to do well. Um, I think that's just it. Uh, we are our own worst critic. And, you know, I, I always said, like, I, I hope I don't screw this up. Um, <laughs> and, 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 being, and being frightened of ruining something, I think that, that's probably it. But I also just want to say, hopefully, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surprise somebody. They're, they're going to be surprised by what they, what they consume. It's going to be interesting. And... Uh, I like I say I, I like it's interesting because I I wasn't there when JD took the first sip there so it's, <laughs> you know it would be nice to kind of see that it's it's it's, it's like if there would be a hidden camera somewhere I could uh, say wow it, did that work out maybe I don't want to see it <laughs> but I I think in general you know put to put the nail on the head there it's just um, doing the the best you can um, not expecting it but. You know, maybe uh, trying to do something outside the box. Um, I've used some spices uh, that many may not have necessarily considered before to, to add for uh, for a mead, and uh, it's just something that maybe spoke to me in the in the food realm that I wanted to explore for myself. And uh, inherently, there was a surprise there. So I say, just try to do something. Um, that works for you, but also might be a, might be a, a quite a nice, nice surprise, you know, when you, when all is said and done. All right. Uh, lastly, you know, you, you don't live far from me. If I oh. were to, uh, you know, wander over to your, uh, backyard here this, uh, this summer, um, what would mm-hmm. I find you have that you've brewed for, you know, summer consumption? Oh well, uh, <laughs> I need to need to maybe get back into basics here, but I I think you know um, definitely looking to do a little bit more in the way of uh, some wheat beers and whatnot for for the summer. But in in, in so far for mead, um, definitely I'm I'm liking a lot of the the sweet um, traditional meads out there. I think that's that's something that I'm I, it it kind of speaks to me. Uh, to do something a little sweet for the summertime, um, but you know, um, it's not not so far off. I think a, a, a Ryan Braggett is a challenge that I'd like to maybe uh, uh, work up to here too. Um, I got a really great Rogue Marion Berry Braggett from your event, and uh, I thought that was phenomenal. So might be uh, might be poised to try a, a couple of experiments here. We'll see. Well, you're <laughs> you're from Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that speaks. Of, yeah. That speaks of the. <laughs> that speaks of the sweet tea, sweet oh, okay. mead, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Absolutely. Been there, done that. Right. Good stuff. <laughs> right. Well, Nathan, thank you for uh, being on the show tonight. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, we'd. Uh, I look forward to seeing you soon around town, and uh, we'd, we'd love to have you back sometime. Absolutely. Keep spinning that wheel, Ryan. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you, Nathan. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Appreciate it. Take care. (laughs) Thanks. Um, Gosh, what do you say after that segment? I mean, my God, Nathan Stegman. um, 
you know, like Ryan said, busting out on the uh, on the mead scene just a few years back. Uh, and uh, I mean, he's got, he's got something going on. Uh, that's for sure. And I, I you know, you know, when that mint vanilla pine thing, guys. I, you know, when we first announced that, I, I remember thinking one night, I'm thinking, how, how do you get? Okay, I get the mint and vanilla, but the pine. Okay, what, what do you do for pine? I'm thinking, what do you do? Go out in the garage and take one of those little hand planers and start planing down a little piece of pine and throw that in a bag and put it in a second. I mean, how do you get that into a, you know? Uh, but Nathan's, uh, I remember tasting Nathan's, and I mean, it was like right on the mark. Uh, I mean, he had it, he had it all uh, really good. I thought it was really good. Yeah, it wasn't just the presence of all three of the flavors, but the balance between them, you know. Yeah. And I, I think that to me was what what separated um, what separated his from the others. What separated uh, the guys that took home uh, medals from from the other entrants it was just, you know, a, a little bit here, a little bit there, just a very fine amount of uh, uh, space between them. But yeah, that the balance was right on the money and was just absolutely perfect for it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we need to uh, we need to have him back on the show as well. I mean, I hope you got an address book going for the show, Ryan, and you're writing down all these names. Uh, we've talked to so many people that uh, I, you know. Uh, I mean, I want to check back in with Nathan and, and see what he's doing in six months, and uh, you know, see where he's at. Uh, how many more medals has he got piled up uh, uh, in his little uh, brew room there? But uh, good stuff, man. Absolutely. All right. What well, we got for segment two? Well, hey, before we get there, uh, let's do this. Temperature is probably the most widely measured physical parameter. It affects the quality of daily life in more ways than most people imagine. You'll find ThermalWorks products in virtually every industry, even in home kitchens. But importantly, you should have ThermalWorks in your home brewery. There are several statistics out there that you need to monitor during fermentation and aging. Gravity and temperature, ThermalWorks has a number of products to help you take accurate readings and monitor progress. Check them out at ThermalWorks.com. And thanks for ThermalWorks and your support of the 2019 Iron Bee. Uh, segment two, guys, a um, couple of things. I uh, wanted to c toss a couple of ideas around the table. This comes out right out of the survey. And also uh, want to get to Jeff uh, uh, talking about cooking with mead, something we haven't touched on uh, for quite some time. Uh, but just uh, just briefly here, I want to toss this around the table. Uh, one, of, one of the feedbacks that we got out of the survey was a response that um, – uh, this particular individual enjoys our discussions on recipe development, uh, also on ingredient characteristics and the different techniques of making meads. Uh, let's deal with the latter first, different techniques for making meads. Um, let's start out with Ryan. Uh, uh, a couple of techniques, maybe one or two, um, uh, that differ from one another on, on making a mead. Well, I, I guess the biggest technique um, difference for me would be uh, temperature and time in um, the time in fermenting and then time in aging. Yeah. So, you know, I I can make a mead really quick. I can use a Kavik yeast and... I can ferment it at a hundred degrees and I can crank it out, you know, in in a couple of days, have primary done, um, you know, degas it, uh, or, you know, carbonate it, whatever I need to do, whatever style it is and, and get it, um, in a cup, you know, in, in a matter of weeks or, you know, a couple of weeks, I mean, a couple of weeks, 10 days, something like that. Um, uh, or, I can, you know, like I'm doing with this, this, uh, um, payment that I use this, that kit that I got, that, that, uh, free kit that had been damaged. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I do a really, really slow fermentation. That thing is sitting in the, in the mid sixties, maybe it's, you know, going at a, it's a couple of points a day, maybe. I mean, it is, it's fermenting extremely slowly. It's fermenting very cool. And then I am going to move that over to a secondary and uh, let it sit on some oak for a while. And then um, I, I'm going to just kind of lay it down and just let it sit for probably another few months in the bottles on the wine rack and just kind of let it develop and come together and, and mature a little bit. So I get, and to tell you the truth, some people are going to say, Hey, I, I really like that one. Other people are going to say, you know, that's good, but I, I prefer the other one, the one that I cranked out, yeah. you know, a week or 10 days. Um, so it's not to say there's one, one better. It's just, it's different. It's, uh, sure. you know, do you want, you know, what do you, what do you feel like having, you know, you want a, a salmon or steak, you know, and it's the different people, it's just, it's just what they prefer. So I guess that's, that would be the biggest technique different maybe that I'm having, uh, you know, nutrients. I wouldn't, I don't really have different nutrient techniques. I just have different regimens based on the style and the gravity and the, and the ingredients, you know, if they're already giving enough, um, you know, what, what the nutrients are already providing so that, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the first thing that comes to mind for me. Uh, how about you guys? Well, one of the um, techniques that I've employed, and this goes back to my two port projects, um, you know, uh, these two projects require not an enormous amount of honey, uh, but a significant amount. We're talking, you know, upwards of 13, 14 pounds of honey. Now, a lot of people would dump that in all at once and, you know, begin their fermentation after a good solid, uh, you know, mixing. Uh, however, these port projects, because I'm using a wine yeast, and the whole idea here is to push that yeast beyond uh, its stated, uh, uh, you know, capability. I and mean, we're looking for a 19, 20 percent, uh, you know, uh, mead here. So um, one of the techniques that I've employed is actually step feeding the honey. Not throwing the entire 13 or 14 pounds in all at once, but starting out with, uh, you know, say maybe maybe 50% or 60% of it, uh, and starting at that point and getting it fermenting. And then over the course of, you know, maybe a week or, or three or four days, depending upon the gravity readings, uh, adding a little bit more honey. Uh, and doing it that way. Now, one of the things that I found when you do that, uh, I think you're able to bring out a little bit more honey character that way because uh, it doesn't get all ate up all at one time. Um, I'm not a scientist. I couldn't, you know, uh, I'm sure there are some people out there who probably say, what are you talking about, J.D.? Uh, well, it works for me. And, uh, you know, I think that's what's happening. I don't know. But that's a technique that I have used several times, not just on the port meads, uh, but I've also used them on the Ryan Braggots too. Uh, rather than, you know, the, fir the first Ryan Braggot I did, I put the honey in, in during cool down. I get, you know, drop below 100 degrees, add the honey, done deal, put it in the fermenter, and, and uh, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, uh, off and running. Well, here lately, I've not been doing that. I've actually started the fermentation and then added the honey. And, uh, you know, uh, I think I'm getting better results that way. Uh, this one that I've gotten a fermenter right now uh, was done that way. Uh, I've also added uh, one a little di different direction. I've also added the, uh, you guys remember Cascade beer candy syrup? Uh and that special batch uh, that was uh, made for me, the bourbon bacon, uh, <laughs> well, that went in. Uh, about a pound and a half of it went into this uh, at High Cross and along with the with the honey. So that's a technique that I've uh, uh, been using. Jeff, uh, 
a technique that uh, you know may not fit the mold that you know you you typically see out there amongst mead makers. Uh, have you done anything that uh, kind of outside the realms of the standard? Here's how you make a mead thing. You know, um, <laughs> prior to the the fake yeast, um, I, I did try my hand at. Uh, you know some of those uh, the recipes that Ricky the mead, mead maker threw up on his website. Oh yeah, you know using um, D forty seven at uh, eighty six degrees. Yeah, yeah, and you know <laughs> those are a little bit wild. Uh, you get some you get some flavor compounds in there that are, are you know some people would consider that a like a byproduct of an incomplete fermentation, but I got to admit they're pretty damn tasty um, for. Uh, for what it is, for being a session mead, uh, it's very drinkable, very light. Uh, I love the carbonation in it, and um, yeah, it was it was uh, a lot of fiddling to make that happen. Just getting a, uh, if you guys remember, I talked about having basically like an aquarium set up that I was keeping a uh, keeping my fermenters in a hot water bath for. Um, you know, I've since gotten one of those uh, wraparound heaters for my. Uh, my five, I'm sorry, my uh, seven gallon buckets that work a lot better. Um, but yeah, no, that was uh, that was a little bit outside the box, and I was kind of fairly pleased with the results, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, that said, I think, uh, <coughs> pardon me, mm-hmm. <coughs> seconding you and Ryan, um, I, I think. Really, it, it's less coming down to a technique and more just an overall approach um, that uh, kind of differentiates uh, different meads I'm making. You know, if I'm going to make a session mead, I I think uh, for for lack of a better way to say it, I I just take it a little bit more relaxed um, than I do you know, something higher gravity in the the ten to fourteen percent range. Um, you know, with a session bead, I kind of tend to just throw every all the nutrient in up front, um, put all the ingredients in there. I'll degas it. Uh, you know, <clears throat> pardon me. Bless you. I'll degas it in the evening um, when I get home from work, or you know, as I'm uh, uh, getting uh, getting ready for bed myself. Um, but I don't really put a lot of thought or put a lot of worry or effort into it. I just kind of you know check on it as needed, say, oh, oh, it's come along. Oh, that's about done. It's done. Um, with, uh, with the higher ABV meads, I put a lot more, you know, stress and mindfulness into it. You know, you do the step feeding with the, the Tosna or the Tiosna, like I like with the Fermade K, um, you know, degas it at least twice a day, uh, keep an eye on it. You know, I've, uh, I think both of you guys got a little bottle of the, um, it's a, uh, a Belgian golden strong braggot uh, that I put together. I tried step feeding for the first time in that and was pretty pleased with the amount of uh, the, the varietal honey character I was getting out of it. Um, so I may I may try that as well. But, yeah, I, I feel like when I do a higher ABV mead, there are just a lot more moving parts and a lot more mindfulness going into the brew, um, whereas, you know, the... The session meets kind of remind me of putting a beer together where uh, the few times I've done just a straight beer and a kit or whatever, I kind of just, you know, I have my brew day, I set it to the side, and I forget about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've been there and done that. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the, um, uh, you know, uh, also in this was uh, recipe development. And uh, I'm, I don't look at this as, well, I, I guess it's in two parts. One, uh, what I do is I, I, I take notes. I write down what I'm thinking, okay? I mean, it's not a recipe. I'm just, I write down flavors. I'll write down ingredients, uh, you know, and I'll be thinking about, you know, what, what grains maybe. I might write down, a, you know, a list of grains that I want to use, uh, and then you know, you know, develop a recipe from there. Uh, I get an idea in my head. Um, you know, do I want caramel flavors to be prominent? Um, you know, and I, I particularly uh, in in my mead making, I deal with basically one kind of honey. I mean, I've got several kinds here, but 
it's the wildflower. And uh, let me tell you that I want to put a word out to South Dakota, dude, uh, South Dakota, you're, you're in my 411 because you got honey like you wouldn't believe. Uh, Tom Repus is going to hear this and he's going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but when I put a get, when I put a recipe, when I develop a recipe, I, I write down the ideas, the flavors that I want to try to capture. And from from there, uh, I use the Brewers Friend uh, program uh, that I, which I'm a member. I pay, you know, the subscription and everything. I just I love that that uh, that uh, program, and uh, I incorporate my recipes into that. And uh, you know, so when I'm developing a recipe, I'm not so much concerned about. Um, how much of each ingredient or whatever uh, as much as I am putting it all together so that it so that it works together so that it all works together uh, because uh, I've done things in the past where I've kind of over you know like the honey malt you can completely overdo the honey malt if you're not careful a little bit of that really does go a long way uh, and if you're not careful it'll t completely overpower anything that you're you're trying to do with it so you learn from those kind of things um but uh i mean i don't know how much of, of recipe development that actually is for me but uh typically i take my time with it uh, i'll play around with the ideas in a brewer's friend i'm always manipulating uh different amounts to to come to the ab you know i mean i don't want something that's uh you know nine or ten percent maybe i only want something that's uh an after you know, uh, uh, you know, on a hot Saturday afternoon, sitting out at the picnic table around the pool or whatever, uh, something light, something refreshing, something low ABV, uh, and something that's not going to give me a headache the next morning. So, uh, I give all those considerations when I'm when I'm developing a recipe. Ryan, when you're putting a recipe together, uh, are there considerations that you give initially uh, before you arrive? at the uh, at the final uh, uh, at the final deal yeah i'm i'm just going to focus on one aspect here just to be time sensitive um but let's talk about my braggots um you know when i put together the ryan braggot procedure you know the the ryan braggot that i typically make you know with the with the pills and malt and then i do i let that hit high croissant and then i had the honey after that so kind of echoing what you guys are talking about a little bit there in your technique um and there's no specialty malt in that you know this that was designed i kind of made that to uh really hit um let, let the hops shine through really let the hop aroma and and flavor is just just really come through so that's why I, I do it that way. Now, I make a lot of other braggots. I've made, you know, porter-style braggots, stout-style braggots, you know, different kinds of stout-style braggots, you know, from mm -hmm. chocolate stouts, tropical stouts, imperial stouts, oatmeal stouts, um, uh, you know, some porters and um, other, a handful of others as well. Um, anyway, when I'm doing that, uh, I... I, t I think about specialty grains first. So, uh, you know, when you make a beer, and I'll do this kind of juxtaposition, the uh, conventional wisdom or, or at least the loudest voices in the homebrewing you know, communities typically say that, you know, you should have 70 to 80 percent base malt, you know, and then, you know, and then maybe 20 percent you know, specialty grains, that kind of thing. Well, I'm not worried about that. And and part of the reason is, you know, I'm not trying to make a true to style beer. I'm mm -hmm. making a braggot. And we're using the honey as I'm using the honey as, as a lot some of that essentially quote unquote base malt. So I think about the specialty greens. I think about what I want to get out of the specialty greens, you know, flavor, color, etc. So using uh, different crystal malts or caramel malts or using, uh, you know, thing, aromatic malts or honey malts or different roasted malts or, or flaked, uh, you know, different flaked 
barley or wheat or oatmeal uh, or things like that. So I start with that. I build out I build out the flavor profile from the specialty malts and build my flavor profile and my color from there and then use additional base malts um if if needed to hit the gravity that i'm going for unless you know if, if i didn't want to do it all honey so i talked last week about one a braggot that i made that was all it was a braggot and it was all specialty greens all you know that were the green portion and then really the honey was essentially the quote unquote base malt. Um, so uh, that's the way I think what I, I don't, I, I uh, if I want to get, you know, a biscuit flavor or a coffee flavor or chocolate flavor or things like that, you know, and again, I, I use the first friend um, to help kind of figure out different gravities and, and things like that. Um, but, I, I take a decidedly different approach to designing a braggot than designing a beer. Uh, and, and, uh, it's, it's worked out pretty well. Um, yeah. So, so I guess that would be the biggest way that I approach putting together a, um, a recipe, uh, for one of my braggots. Yeah. Jeff cooking with mead. Um, I've actually only had one experience uh, where I where I've taken a mead and incorporated it, and I think I probably mentioned it on the show a couple of times, maybe, maybe once before. Uh, I spent enough episodes back we can talk about it again, but um, I had this bottle of mead uh, that was sent to me. It was a a fruit mead, a mel mel, uh, and it was a little a little little on the sweet side for me a little little too punchy for me uh just to sit and drink it so i thought what can i do with it i don't want to throw it away cuz it's, it's i mean it was good you know don't get me wrong it was good stuff really good uh just not quite my palate so i thought well you know what do i do with this so i, I we were cooking a pork roast um and you know, I, I went on a weekend, and I knew that we were going to do a pork roast. This is kind of a low and slow thing for me when I do my pork roast. I mean, it takes all day long. And I thought, why don't I? You know, I mean, pork and berries go together. I mean, you know, you may not think about it much, but like pork and blackberry glaze. Oh my god! Uh, so I took this berry, rich berry sweet mead. And I put it in a pan, the whole bottle, and I reduced it down probably oh, at least two thirds, and uh, dropped a little pat of butter in it. Uh, and I think I added some garlic and uh, maybe even a part of a shallot. And I created this glaze for this pork roast. And I just kept basting the pork roast all day long with this with this mead glaze and dude I, I, let me tell you something that was probably the best pork roast i ever had in my life <laughs> so that's my only experience with with cooking with mead uh would i do it again hell yeah uh in a heartbeat would i make a mead uh just to just to come up with sauces and glazes and stuff and, and marinades hell yeah uh, maybe not a five gallon batch, but whatever, you know, a gallon batch, uh, put it in a sure. bottle and that's my, you know, I'll, I'll use that. I mean, you know, you don't have to use the whole bottle. I mean, you know, I, I use the entire, it was a 750 milliliter bottle that I used for this glaze. So, you know, but by the time you reduce it down and everything, you're left with, you know, maybe, maybe a cup. Uh, but my God, uh, what that did to that pork roast was just unbelievable. Well, yeah, and you know the it's funny you mentioned the uh, idea of making a a meat specifically to cook with that uh, it kind of immediately reminds me of the first time Ash was on the show. He talked about the uh, that Yerpa <laughs> meat, yeah, um, yeah, uh, which which still sounds like a fantastic experiment. And you know, I could see even doing like you know a Vidalia onion mead. Oh, uh, yeah. that you could do some interesting stuff with that. I think um, I'm not sure I would want to drink that straight, but. You know, you uh, 
you, you get the right cut of meat and, and uh, let that kind of simmer in that. Um, you know, the, the, the one time that I've had a, a really good experience cooking with meat, uh, when it came to a meat, I had a pork loin and, you know, yeah, it, it, we're, we're talking about pork a lot, but it really fit. Um, I had a pork loin and I had this tangerine meat that I'd made. Um, and it was one of those projects that I, I put it together and it wouldn't clear and it wouldn't clear and it wouldn't clear. So it got stuck in the back of the cabinet. And then I, uh, I took a look at it like another month later. I'm like, it cleared. I, it's time to bottle this sucker. Um, what it didn't occur to me though was to taste it. Mm. And <laughs> oh my God, it was the driest damn thing I have ever made. Um, I usually like a dry mead, but uh, it was. I, I, I cracked open a bottle and went, "Damn, um, I I should have back sweetened that." Yeah, more like, "Oops." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, we it, I, it was only a gallon batch, so I, I didn't have that many bottles. I had to do something with. I'm I'm too cheap to just pour it down the drain. Uh, and I tried a few different things. I you know I mixed some uh, some citrusy gin that my wife had. Um, to make a little meat cocktail and that came out. Okay. That was drinkable. Um, you know, tried the little, uh, the spritzer trick, you know, you pour some, uh, um, some soda water or something like that into, uh, yeah. a, a glass, top it with some of the mead. Uh, that was all right. It wasn't my thing. What I really enjoyed though, I took a pork loin, um, and, uh, had, uh, a bottle of that that I braised that pork loin in along with some, I think mm. some rosemary, some sage and some, uh, some dried apricots. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And they're just, uh, the, the act of braising it, like letting it sit in just the very smallest amount of that liquid and kind of having the steam get up in there, um, for, you know, like you said, low and slow, keep it covered. Uh, but that just made it real tender. It got that, uh, that fruit flavor really nicely suffused into the meat. Um, uh, and then, you know, you, you scrape down the, the pan and make a nice little gravy for it afterwards. It came out real well. Um, I was pretty pleased with that kind of just off the cuff cooking that night. Um, yeah. And I'm, I, I, I'm very curious to hear if anybody else in our audience is, uh, has tried much cooking with meat because it's, uh, something that I've been, I've been kind of thinking of, especially, you know, with, uh, the the back stock of meats I've got now. Uh, what do I do with all this this mead? You know, I could drink it all, but really shouldn't. Um, it'd be interesting to see you know what people are coming up with. And I've seen some wild stuff on like you know Reddit, Facebook, things like that. Uh, you, we, we've talked about kind of uh, yeah, JD. I think you were mentioning having basically like a um, like a constant mead starter, kind of like a sourdough starter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I want to say a month or two ago, I saw a post where somebody had actually used the like the leaves or the uh, the the leftover um, uh, wine yeast. I think it was even D forty seven or like seventy one B, and used that as the leavening uh, for a bread. Sure, uh, yeah. they said it was interesting. It came out uh, it came out a little strange, but it was it was good. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the, these kind of off the cuff experiments with meat. I'm, I'm interested in hearing more from. So if you guys have recipes or stuff you've tried, let us know. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on the website. Um, our, our patrons can shoot us a message there. Um, uh, I would love to hear more about what you guys are coming up with. You know, uh, I, I, I used to bake, I don't bake quite so much anymore, but I used to bake bread, uh, at least twice a week. And, uh, uh, oftentimes I would make a beer bread. I mean, it's just simply replacing, you know, the liquid with beer. Um, and it's, you know, I've used different beers. Uh, you, you, I, you know, I'm not going to sit here and go through the whole list, but you got to try it <laughs> at least once. Uh, you'll get some surprising results out of that. And I've used malt, actual powdered malt, uh, like uh, like pills and malt. Uh, you know, throw a couple of tablespoons in uh, as well into a bread mix. Ryan, have you? I I know you you cook. You do the cooking at your house. Uh, that breakfast that we had uh, that morning after the Iron Bee was just phenomenal. Uh, I know you're a damn good cook, and I know you've cooked with meads. Uh, so uh, have you got a couple of ideas you want to toss out there real quick before we uh, get to uh, Facebook friends? 
Yeah, I, I cooked with with me the other night. I I poured the chicken stock into the risotto and sat there stirring it with one hand and and drank a glass of meat with the other. <laughs> and then when it the, was empty, I put more chicken stock in the risotto and, and stirred that some more while I poured another glass of meat and drank that. And I was uh, I did that two more times and was cooking with me. It ended up with an amazing risotto, just creamy like you wouldn't believe. And, um, you know, the meat was right there with me the whole time. Yeah. No. So, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> in in the words of Julia Child, I love cooking with wine. Sometimes I even put it in the food. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, I've I did. I had a mead that. Yeah. Um, I've had I've had more than one mead that didn't exactly work out, but one of them did. I used it as a really nice uh, marinade for chicken i let the i let the some chicken marinate in it for a while and then and then cooked it and then did reserve some additional some, some out of the bottle and and um you know brushed that on as it was as it was cooking as well and it was good it, so i've i've done that i've used it as as a uh, a marinade as kind of a basting liquid or a uh as well haven't i haven't created any recipes or meads for recipes like like a garlic mead or uh or an onion mead or or a jalapeno mead or something that you know i've designed for cooking i've always kind of made made do with things that today this didn't really turn out all the way that i wanted it to um and uh, you know, just, just found a way to use it. I did, uh, make, did, did do a, a brat boil. So this is your, your boil brats and beer. And I boiled some, a brat in a, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was kind of a, it was kind of a melomel, a light melomel. Hmm. And before I grilled them and that was excellent. That gave it this nice little, Kind of a, I think I remember kind of a cherry flavor, kind of a fruit, a little bit of a light fruit flavor. So you know, boiling, adding, adding some of that to your boiling liquid for broths can be great. It doesn't have to be just along the braggot line either. It can be, you know, uh, maybe something that got really oxidized or something that has a lot of off flavors. Mm-hmm. Um, and and really, I mean, it can be anything. It could be fruit. It could be spice. It could be whatever. And just give just a tiny bit of flavor to your to your brats, and um, yeah, that's that's one I've uh, I've probably liked the most. I've taken um, <laughs> you, know, you know the people out there are probably going to turn their stomach to this, but uh, if you if you like fish, okay, salmon in particular. Now this is going to sound like the weirdest combination you have ever heard of in your life, but. Uh, take a little bit of blackberry jam and put it in a pan, heat it up uh, until it starts to bubble. You don't want to burn it, so be careful. There's a lot of sugar in there. Uh, but heat it up until it starts to bubble, and then drop a little pat of butter in it, and then brush that over the top of a piece of salmon, okay, and bake it, and then brush it again when it comes out of the oven. I mean, you talk about something delicious. Oh, my God. Um... Good stuff, guys. Uh, you know, something I want to throw out there while we're talking about meat and food, I want to plug this again. This is The Art of Meat Tasting and Food Pairing. This is a book by Chrissy Mannion Zerpour. Guys, if you don't have this book, okay, you need to get it. I mean, this is um, uh, one of the most fantastic uh, mead books out there. Uh, and, I mean, there's tons and tons of recipes in there. Kind of along the same lines. I mean, it's not necessarily cooking with meat, but pairing meats with foods. And you can also learn to cook some of these recipes with these particular meats as well. The Art of Meat Tasting and Food Pairing by Chrissy Mannion Zerpour. Um, off the top of my head, uh, I feel ashamed about this. Ryan, I can't remember the website. Meat and Food. Meatandfood.com. Mead, mead, uh, yeah, meadandfood.com. No, meadandfoodpairing.com. 
I'll tell you what, it'll, it'll be in the show notes, okay? Uh, everybody check the show notes. Uh, it we'll it is just uh, meatandfood.com. Meatandfood.com, okay? The Art of Meat Tasting Food Pairing by Chrissy Mannion's Airport. Outstanding book. Uh, makes a great coffee. And I think if you book. order from her website versus Amazon, she autographs it for you. Yeah. Uh, definitely get this book. I mean, this is, uh, I'm constantly looking through this thing and coming up with ideas for dinner, uh, on the weekends that I cook here. Um, we're, uh, kind of skinny on time here. So, uh, let's get to a couple of Facebook friends here. Always like to do this, uh, as often as we can here at the meat house, uh, on the podcast. I, I got a couple here. Uh, one, I, I know we've talked about this before. This is uh, this should be a real no-brainer. Uh, he's talking about coconut, Ryan, in primary and or secondary. Toast of the coconut. But he's asking about how how should he uh, how much should he be should be concerned about coconut oil? Um, quickly, can you uh, can you help? This is Patrick Sheehan from Modern Mead Makers. Well, if he's if he's using toasted coconut, then very little. Uh, I mean, you're not you're you're toasting it. You're you're cooking out most of the oils, uh, and you you've got a the amount you're putting in isn't going to cause any issues. Yeah. Uh, so very little. Now, the two things with coconut to know are that you've got to use a lot of it to get fl- good flavor depending on the style. I mean, if you're making a, a really, if you're just got a traditional and you're going to put coconut in it, you probably don't need as much as if you've got an imperial stout braggot that you want to introduce coconut to. Um, but you do need to use a lot of it, and it will fade. Now, uh, in, in secondary, that's why I, I like using it in secondary, uh, and... You've got to, again. It's 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 going to fade. It's, it's going to fall out on you. So use even more than you want if you're not going to drink it right away. The other one that I have used that there are some coconut products out there that you can use. Um, you know, both Amoretti makes uh, coconut flavoring, and uh, Cascade beer candy syrups makes a coconut. I think it's toasted coconut candy syrup. Now. The benefit to using a, a product like that is that that flavor becomes more shelf stable. Mm-hmm. So instead of the coconut falling out right away, it will it Last will um, stick around. Now again, I'd use both those products uh, later on during fermentation. So you know after your most vigorous fermentation has taken place, or you know, or just in secondary. Yeah. And uh, the other one I got, Jeff, uh, this is from Jeffrey Smith, wine and mead making enthusiast. It says he's uh, read several opinions on how long you should leave the fruit bag in the primary before removing it. Some are saying no longer than five days from pitching yeast, but others say seven to 11 days. How long do you leave your fruit bag in the primary and or (laughs) secondary for that matter? You know, um, I, I think for one, it depends on the fruit. Um, there are some fruits that, you know, you you may not want as much uh, extraction or presence from. Uh, you may be more worried about pulling, you know, odd vegetal flavors from. For the most part, when I work with fruit, it stays in primary until primary is done. Um, mm-hmm. I'll put it in there at or shortly, you know, after that kind of Krausen phrase, and uh, it gets moved right before I move it into secondary or, you know, wherever I'm going to clear it and bottle it, package it, what have you. Um, I, I don't really worry about it. I, you know, if I'm going to make a fruit mead, um, I tend to want a lot of fruit flavor from it. And then I'm, I'm willing to do as much extraction as I can get out of it, especially when it comes to things like, you know, berries where you're going to get some of those tannins out of them or, um, geez, what else have I done that has, uh, has had a lot of uh, contact time. You know, these strawberries that I'm working with now, strawberries have a lot of liquid in them, and I'm mm-hmm. I'm kind of just hoping that the yeast, as it does its thing, continues to break those down, and uh, I'll get the most 
you know, look what else I can out of it. Um, so yeah, no, I, I don't really, uh, pull it after X amount of time. I'm, I'm kind of in there for the long haul. Uh, not really done a lot with fruit in secondary, but, um, you know, like my approach to that would probably be, you know, put the fruit in there, taste, keep tasting, and you pull the fruit when the flavor is where you want it. Yeah. Let's throw that one back over to Ryan to, uh, Ryan, I mean, you know, I mean, is there a science to this? I mean, do you leave the fruit in there for as long as you want? Do you pull it out uh, as soon as you think it's done? I mean, what's your approach to the whole fruit in the bag thing uh, in primary and or secondary, actually? Yeah, I don't use fruit in primary anymore. I I do it in secondary because I like the flavor. I get better that way. So... I go through my primary fermentation as a, as a traditional, and then I uh, add my fruit in secondary. Uh, and you know, again, it's it's a little bit of of I don't want to say chicken or egg, but I leave it in there until I get the flavor I want, and it's generally never been longer than two weeks. Or you know, some, yeah. Let's just say two weeks, depending on, depending on the fruit. Mm. Uh, it could be a lot quicker than that. So, yeah, the, I, I mean, taste, you should be tasting all the time. You know, if you in, in tasting it, and you'll know. I mean, if if you've left it in there for twelve days and you're starting to taste some off flavors or or some vegetal character you don't like, uh, okay, that's okay. You will learn something. Next time, you know, do it a little bit less than that. But, you know, again, just constantly taste. And and the longer it's in there, maybe the more you taste uh, to start making sure you don't, you can get it right, maybe as you're detecting something or, or hopefully before that, when you've achieved the flavor that you like. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Well, hey, we're going to leave it right there. Uh, I need to send this message out to uh, Ash. Uh, actually, this goes out to uh, Evan Henderson uh, over at Sap House Meadery. Uh, <laughs> once again, you're hearing your name mentioned at the Mead House. Evan, I need you to do me a huge favor, dude. I want you to send me an email at info at the meathouse.com. Include your contact information. We're going to give it over to Ryan, and we're going to try to get you booked on the show. Uh, I know uh, you got the 411 on mead making over at Sap House. Want to get your perspective on how you do it. So, uh, Evan Henderson at Sap House, make sure you get that email to us info at themeathouse.com. Hey, special thanks to our guest today, home mead maker and Iron B MVP winner, Nathan Stigman, for stopping by. Hey, in the meantime, happy mead making. Now, look. I don't know what's going on, but pineapples, little paper umbrellas. Now there's a huge barbecue pit and a whole bunch of banana trees all over the backyard. You two are up to something. Looks like a giant luau, but hey, that's it for this episode. Ryan, hit the lights. Jeff, you know the rule. Slam that door shut. We'll be back next week with episode number 129 of The Mead House. We're gone. We're gone.